All right, so uh, this is Physics 1C for September 29th. We're going to talk for about an hour night about um, the topics up here. We will probably just get through the first two things in the list, and we'll leave the rest of the stuff for next time, um, depending on you know just how long it takes. Uh, we're going to talk about EMF. We're going to talk about sources of EMF. We're going to talk about internal resistance inside of batteries. Uh, and we're going to talk about electric power. All right, so um, EMF, what's that word mean? We're going to see this word show up a lot. Uh, in the next few uh, weeks. So what is it? So we use the symbol E, okay? And it stands for EMF, okay? And what's EMF? EMF is uh, electromotive force. Now it's kind of a misnomer because it's not really a force. It is effectively equivalent. It's not the same thing, but it's related to electric potential. So it's, we'll just say it's, it's kind of similar to uh, potential difference, okay? It's not the same thing, but it's kind of similar. Electromotive force is some type of thing um, that can put a force, okay, onto an electron and make it move. So that's why we use the word force. It's a type, it's something that can make electrons move inside of a circuit, okay? And, um, there, there are a lot of examples of, of different types of sources of EMF, and we're going to talk about that uh, now. Any, any, any system that we look at, um, any type of electrical circuit that we look at, is going to have to have some type of a source of an EMF uh, to, make it, to make it work, okay? There are uh, a lot of simple examples of these. The simplest example that we will use frequently is going to be your just basic DC battery, okay? A battery is a source of EMF. It has a certain amount of EMF associated with it, okay? Um, uh, other examples. This is basically anything that can produce electricity. Okay, a battery stores up energy, and you can release it le later in the form of electricity. Um, other sources of EMF are um, are generators. I'll give you guys. I'll show you guys a little picture of like what this looks like. Um, and now, the generators themselves. Um, when I say generator, I usually mean something that basically um, this, this is going to be something that turns. Uh, mechanical motion or mechanical energy. Mechanical. Is that how you spell that? I don't know. Turns mechanical motion into EMF. Okay. What does a battery do? Well, a battery basically uses chemistry. Uh, basically, what's called like a, a redox reaction to create a separation of charges and to create a flow of charges between an anode and cathode, and it uses that to produce an EMF. Okay, there's other forms of ways that you can produce these things. Now, generators is a general, this is usually what we use to produce most power. Um, there's another type of electrical thing, which would be just solar cells. And solar cells basically use um, the energy in the beam of light to knock electrons off of the plate and then that produces uh, an electromotive force. Okay, so this basically uses, we could say, light energy. And the light basically, the idea is that, you know, light comes in, it knocks photons off a plate, or sorry, it knocks electrons off of a plate, um, and, and use that to produce an electromotive force, okay? What else is there? I don't know. Are there anything as you guys can think of? Now, contained within generators is going to be hydro, hydroelectric generators. You're going to have um, uh, fossil, fossil fuel powered generators like, you know, coal-fired plants. You're going to have nuclear. You're going to have um, wind generation. All of these are going to be anything where there is a mechanical motion that... Uh, so heat, like thermocouples. Yeah, I think that's enough. That would be one. So heat, uh, so, so thermocouples is an example of something. Okay, I don't know why my undo's not working. That's weird. There we go. Um, yeah, so like thermocouples. Oh, there's just nothing left to undo. So we'll just say heat, which is a thermocouple. A thermocouple basically uses um, differences in temperature to produce a very tiny amount of electricity. What mechanical motion does a nuclear produce? Okay. So let's let's talk about let's talk about these two things right here. Um, so so a battery, what does the battery do? Well, shown in this picture is is kind of some idea of what might be happening in a battery. I don't think it's a particularly good picture, but anyway. 
You've got an ideal source of EMF. You've got some electric potential difference, VAB, between these two points, right? So V is a potential, B is a potential. There's some potential difference between these two. What would that be? It might be something like, on a, on a standard like D cell battery, this might be something like 1.5 volts. On the batteries that you put into your like smoke detector, it might be 9 volts, okay? Um, so that's what this potential difference is right here. You have one terminal that's at a higher potential, the positive side, one of the negative side. And what happens is inside of here, you've got some electric fields that points downwards because you have positives and you have negatives. However, in order to make it work, you need to have some kind of a non-electrostatic force tending to move charge to a higher potential, okay? What this non-electrostatic force is, it could be any of the things written right here. It could be a redox reaction. It could be a mechanical motion. It could be a solar cell that uses light energy. All of those contribute to this non-electrostatic force. And that non-electrostatic force is going to lift on electrostatic force, okay? It might be due to chemistry. It might be due to motion of a magnet. It might be due to light, okay? Um, yep, Meares is right. That's exactly what happens. In a nuclear reactor, you heat up a fluid, generally water. It creates steam. The steam is then blown over a turbine, which generates electricity. The turbine generates electricity because it has a magnet attached to it, and that magnet rotates inside of some coils. And that's what we'll be discussing for the next few weeks here as we discuss uh, magnetism. The other forms of nuclear power, but that's most common right now. Yeah, that's right. Meares is absolutely right. That's also what he's describing of the, yeah, moving magnets make electricity, that's right. So what he's describing is basically this process by which you just need to, you need to get something rotating and so you use steam to do it. And you could you can use nuclear power, sorry, you can, you can use the, the energy created in a nuclear uh, fission process, or you can use the energy created when you burn coal, when you burn wood. You, you could burn wood and produce electricity, by the way. You could burn anything. Um, so yeah. So this is their picture. I, I don't know if this picture is very good. And I'm going to show you a better picture of how a battery works here in a second. But um, let's let's do that actually. So I found this video. You know, there's all kinds of videos on on YouTube explaining how batteries work. I thought this one was really good. Um, it, it's really long, unfortunately, and I'm going to link it so that you guys can watch it if you want to. But I'm, we're not going to watch the whole thing tonight, although. It might be valuable to do so. But somewhere in the middle here, he started explaining kind of how a battery is constructed. He starts off by saying, during some chemical reactions, electrons can be released from one atom and absorbed by another atom. We can, we'll, I'll make sure we talk about superconductors tonight before we finish me ours, okay? We'll do that. But um, yeah, so here's where he kind of like builds the, uh, the thing. So let me, we're gonna watch, I don't wanna watch the whole thing here. I want to watch, like, a minute of this. How far does this go? Is it a minute? I hope we don't get a, uh... Yeah, okay, it's gonna be longer than that. But we're, we're watching it. I don't care. It's, it's, it's actually pretty good, so we're gonna watch it. We're gonna change windows. We're gonna go to this one. You guys tell me... Uh, I'm gonna start it. And, um, you tell me if, um, you can hear the, the volume. Yeah. Can you hear it?
going to mention one thing here. There's a, there's a, you have to watch the full video to see it. There's a separator right here that has porous holes. Um, that only lets smaller things through, so it doesn't let these black atoms through. The manganese oxide doesn't let them through, but it does let the hydroxides through. So that's when he's a separator, that's what he's talking about. There's a separator. Right here. Okay, so your question is, how do you keep the terminal positive? So there's a separation between... So, again, this, you'll have to watch the whole video to see this, but, like, the battery is constructed out of this piece right here, the um, this, this copper little thing right here, and it's separated from the material on the outside here. I don't know if you can tell it's separated, but, like, this piece is separated from this piece. But it, it becomes positive because you're taking electrons. So... The terminal at the top is connected to these guys, okay? These black things right here, the um, manganese oxides, right? That's what the top is connected to. And when the redox reaction occurs right here, these guys are giving up electrons, okay? So they become net positive. These are giving up electrons. So the electrons go here, and if you lose a negative charge, you become positive. And the, everything, uh, the, other, the other stuff in here is designed, like I said, this wall is designed so that the the positive portion never touches the negative portion so this brass this brass little neat uh, i don't know what you want to call it like it's like a nail right this nail ends up staying negative while the casing the casing is actually the whole casing apparently is the positive part all this stuff on the outside right here is the positive part and that's in contact with this so this stays positive and this stays negative i really like these animations right here So that that's feel free to watch the whole thing it's i think a pretty good video i've never watched this person's videos before uh it's called the engineering mindset i will say there were a lot of ads in this video for some reason i do not know why but there were a lot of ads um but i might be checking out more of this 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 i don't know if it's a group or what videos because this one was actually pretty well done it's put out in 20 this was actually just this is really recent most of the main reason i chose it just because it was really recent and then i watched it and i was like this is kind of decent so i don't know do you guys have any questions about that he had a really good, uh, yeah, did you watch the video on capacitors? Did you like it? I actually, I was, I was going to watch this afternoon. Okay, that's, that's really good. Uh, that's, that's really good to hear. Because that's actually, I wanted to watch that one too, to see how he did. Okay, so the battery is a source of EMF. As you saw, it, it can provide the energy you need to move electro things, right? In this case, it's, it's moving electrons. I think that's part of why we call this the electromotive force, is, is it moves things, right? And then when we move those things, we can make them do work for us. 
and that's the main reason why you're you're studying physics 1c that's the this is this is the primary reason why you're studying physics 1c is because we can use the motion of these electrons to power lights to power computers to power the world effectively it's, it's the main way in which uh we in the modern day get things that are not us to do work for us the electrons are like our little workers and they they, they produce work for us um, and there's so many of them and it takes such a little small amount of energy to move them that uh it you know it allows us to do a lot of things that otherwise we wouldn't be able to do okay so let's talk about another form of this uh generators this is anything that turns mechanical emotion uh, into an electromotive force. Um, so a generator is actually the opposite of something called a motor. A motor is a generator in reverse, and we'll be talking about those as well. Um, for this, I'm just gonna show you uh, this simulation right here. Um, this is something that I, it's, it's really unfortunate that we aren't in the actual laboratory because this is one of my favorite things in physics. So what we have here is a coil Okay, it's a, it's a coil. It's connected to a light bulb, all right? And um, we could also change the indicator to be a voltage meter, but we're gonna use a light bulb because it it's definitely more impressive, I think. Because uh, I, I personally, when I think of electricity, I think of light bulbs, I think of lightning, that kind of stuff. So this is it. Uh, the hours said just a second ago, moving magnets equal electricity, right? And they do. Even though this is just an animation, this is in fact exactly what would happen if I set something up like this. Simply by moving the magnet near this, and I don't need to move it into it, but when I move it inside of here, I get a huge impact. This is called induction. This is, yeah, this is called electromagnetic induction, okay? And what we'll learn is that if we increase the area of the loop right here, um, it turns out that that's actually probably going to have a positive impact on what we're seeing. Um, like I said, we could we can put a voltage meter in here and indicate that some, something else is happening here, which is that it goes negative when I go in and it goes positive when I go out. And if I moved it to this side, it goes negative when I go in, positive when I go out. Um, can I flip the, yep. If I go this way, positive in, negative out, flip it around. So that the poles of the magnet actu actually matter a little bit. Um, it also turns out to be the case that if we increase the number of loops here, unfortunately, we can only have one, two, or three in this particular animation. The effect is is amplified. Um, it takes you can see that the, the for just a little bit of motion, the thing's getting a lot brighter. And um, yeah, if you do it frequently enough, you won't even notice that it's flashing. And currently, right now, in the in the lights in you know let's let's say you got the lights in your room. Technically, the lights in your room are, are, are technically flickering like this, except that the rate at which these electrons are moving back and forth, yeah, 60 hertz, 60 times every second, um, the the electrons move up and then down and up and then down and up and then down. And that's a type of current that we call alternating current. We'll, we'll say that in more detail later. But uh, yeah, there you go. So how do we get this to actually produce electricity for us? So that's where the generator comes in. So this generator works off of falling water and a compass, or and a uh, sorry, not a compass, but a. Um, uh, I can't move it, can I? Okay. So the only way I can get this to move then is to simply turn this on, and then what you see happen is that, uh, yeah, this little compass here indicates the direction of the magnetic field at the location, and just by having that guy rotate in a circle, it alters the magnetic field inside of here, and it produces, you know, a light. So this is what I was describing, I'll just switch back real quick, as a generator, okay? Something that takes um, mechanical motion, in this case in terms of, where did it go? Uh, falling water, right? falling water has mechanical motion. Uh, do you have to understand magnetism to understand how this generates electricity? Yeah, I mean, we're gonna, we're gonna go into detail about what it is that's happening here. Um, but uh, I don't think it hurts at all to show you that a generator is basically just a moving magnet and understand that we'll, in about like three weeks, we'll be talking about this process that's called induction. We're gonna, so next week we'll learn about magnets and then the week after that, we'll learn about um, the interaction between electricity and magnet, what we're seeing, what's called Faraday's law of induction. Um, do you need to understand? Yeah, okay. Uh, is it because... It's alternating current, like the polarities. Yes, this is alternating current. Yep. 
Yep, this is what we call alternating current. And the reality is that when when this is when this is when this flickering is happening at a fast enough rate, you don't even notice it basically, right? You you could look at a look at a bulb in your house, you're not going to notice that it's flickering, right? But it is it is technically it's just doing it so fast that you just don't see it. Is that why lights flicker sometimes? Eh. Maybe if you're maybe if there's like a huge drain on the power at your home and there's like a, a weakening of the signal coming to the light bulb, I could see that would cause a flicker. Maybe. There could be other reasons why there's a flicker too. There could be like a loose cable or someone could like bump it or Yeah. But the flickering of the sixty times per second, I don't think you can really see that. Just like you can't really detect the same thing from like old movie projectors. Um, yeah, so there's a few other things that exist on this thing. There's the electromagnet, where you just have a current, and it creates a magnetic field. We did the pickup coil, and then this just shows field lines, basically, which you're, you're kind of familiar with from dipoles, right? I, I remember when we talked about dipoles, some people said, oh, that looks like a magnet. It looks like a magnetic field. Yeah, it does. Okay, so see inside magnet. We can look inside the magnet. How exciting. It's not very exciting, actually. Show a field meter. Huh. There's no Z component. All right, so we did this one. We're going to come back and do a circuit construction in a second. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I highly encourage you guys to explore this website. I've brought it up before, but you can learn a lot about what we're learning in this class with these kind of hands-on type of interactions. So. Okay, and then solar cells, we're not going to do, I'm not going to show you an animation of this. I think you guys get the idea of how a solar cell works to at least to a basic level where, you know, you have light, it shines on this this panel, that panel turns that light energy into an EMF, right? Sources of EMF, okay? You're either going to get it in this class, our, our source of EMF are either going to be a battery or we're going to have a generator. Those are basically what we're going to have in this class. Okay, now, we learned last time about resistance. And resistance is this, uh, this idea that um, when you try to pass electric current um, through a wire, there's always going to be some resistance to the passage of that current, okay? The same thing is true of batteries, okay? Batteries tend to have a, a, a what's called an internal resistance. Oh. So I need to, yep, we're not on um, change windows, screens, good. Yeah, I forgot that I, uh... oh, because, okay, you guys were still able to see all this stuff because it was still in the in the Chrome browser, so we're, I think we're good. You guys can see the, uh, the one note again, I assume. Is that right? Okay. So yeah, so let's start over again. Um, Batteries are always going to have some amount of internal resistance, okay? And this equation represents how we understand that resistance. The idea is that the source itself is going to have some amount of EMF, which we represent with E, but by passing any electrical current through that source, it's going to, re it's going to reduce the terminal voltage by some amount, and that's going to depend on the internal resistance of the source itself. So... We're, we're just going to kind of look at a problem because I don't I don't know how else to teach you what this equation means other than to apply it to a to, to, to apply it to an electrical circuit, all right? Um, as we go through these problems, you're going to want to get used to these symbols that are drawn in this diagram right here. So I've included this so you can look at it. Um, anytime you see a line, it's a conductor. It's like a wire that has negligible resistance. Anytime you see a little squiggle like this often with an R above it or with 10 ohms, that's a resistor. That's a device. What a resistor is, is it something that turns electrical energy into heat, basically. A very common example of, of a resistor that you might find in your home is if you have a toaster. I don't have a toaster. Maybe you guys have toasters. If you have a toaster on the inside of the toaster, those little tiny curled up wires that you can see that glow really hot when you plug it in, does anyone know what I'm talking about? Inside of a toaster? I guess I could pull up a picture of this. 
You guys know what I'm talking about, right? You've seen this before. They get they glow right. Yeah, they 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 turn red on the inside, right? Um, so just like this right here. It could be yeah. This would be like a all kinds of different things. It's lit it's it's quite literally little pieces of wire, and this is a good picture of it. They're often wound up into these little tiny like coils. Okay, the reason why they wind up into coils is you want to make it as long as you possibly can. Because we learned last time that the resistance of a piece of wire is proportional to how long the wire is. It's also proportional to the diameter of the wire. And it's proportional to the res resistivity of the wire. So you, you choose, like, maybe carbon coils or something. Some type of coil that's going to do a good job of, t of taking that electricity. And when you literally, when you try to push the electrons through here, what happens? The electrons start to rub against the material and, and they, they produce heat. You stared at them lovingly while making a Pop-Tarts as a kid. Yeah, I did too. Uh, space heaters are another example of this. It, it's 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 definitely it's quite literally just little wires that when you pass electricity through them, they heat up. That is what a resist. When you think resistor, that's the the first thing you should think is I what I think is a toaster. Um, but you should just understand that it's any device that takes electricity and turns it into heat. And of course, once you have heat, you can cook things, right? Electric stoves work off the same principle, right? Those stoves that have that black like circular ring. Right? That's another example of, of, of a device that, that takes electricity and turns it into heat. Turns it into internal energy, but saying heat to some extent a little easier. Um, this symbol right here, which I think you've seen me use before, is the source of EMF. The longer vertical line always represents positive. I might not always write that. Your book might not always write that, but I'll try to remember to do so. Um, these two are a source of EMF with an internal resistance R. So basically, this is just a combination of these two. If you think about it, it's just here's your battery and there's the resistance of the battery. And then you've got two meters. The V with the circle is a voltmeter. It measures potential difference between terminals. And then A is an ammeter, which measures current flowing through it. You will always see the voltmeter placed in parallel. You will always see the ammeter placed in series. So, let's see if we can keep some, I think we can keep these on the picture a little bit here. So with this set of things, here's an example of a circuit. This is what we'll be dealing with basically for this week. And I think circuits, or something you're going to see quite a bit of in this class. All right, so this is a source in a complete circuit. Uh, it says we add a four ohm resistor to the battery. Uh, there's a previous problem that they're talking about from another example. We're skipping that one because it's just uh, forming a complete circuit. What are the voltmeter and ammeter readings? That's the voltmeter. That's the ammeter. We want to figure out what they are, basically. So here's our picture. The only equations that we have so far are these. We learned about Ohm's law last time, which says the potential difference between two points, delta V, is equal to the current multiplied by the resistance. The other equation that we have is for the battery, that delta V should be equal to the EMF of the battery minus the current flowing in the system multiplied by the internal resistance of the battery. Okay. In this problem, what we have is little r is equal to two ohms. That's the internal resistance of the battery. The ideal EMF of our source is 12 volts. So this is like a 12 volt battery. And it's been connected with a wire here to an external resistor that's called R and it has a resistance of four ohms. So our goal here then is to figure out what the current I is. And we also wanna read out what the, volt, the voltage between these two points, what's this voltmeter here gonna read basically, okay? We can even, if we want to construct the circuit on another page after we're done and uh, see if, see if we, what it says is right. I don't know if we can do this part. So this problem is, uh, it's, we're going to go through this pretty fast. Uh, what I'm going to say is that the potential difference between point A and point B is what you're going to read out as delta V. This is going to be the potential between point A and B. And that's what the voltmeter is going to read out. The other thing I'm going to say is to notice that for our resistor, the resistor is going to have a potential difference across it that's going to be it's going to be i times r. These two are going to have a potential difference that's going to be e minus i times little r, and these two are going to be equal to each other in this case. The reason why they're going to be equal is because when you measure the uh, potential difference in a circuit, you're always going to pick two points, and the potential difference between points a and a prime is going to be zero. The reason I can say that is because it's a wire. And one of the things we learned is that if you have a wire and it has no resistance, there's gonna be no potential drop across it. 
you're going to have the same potential all across the wire. This is one of the properties of conductors that we learned earlier in class, is that if you have a conductor, all points of that conductor have to be at the same potential, uh, assuming that there's nothing in between. If I put a battery in here, that's no longer going to be true. Okay. If I put a resistor in here, it's no longer going to be true that these two points are the same in terms of potential. But as long as it's just a wire, then the potential at A is the same as the potential at A prime. So that means whether I connect this voltmeter like I have here, or whether I were to connect the voltmeter down here, it's going to read the same thing. And that's why we can make the statement that I did, that these two equations have to be equal to each other. Does anyone have any questions? I understand if that was confusing. No? All right. So this tells us that the current flowing through our resistor, okay, that's represented by I, that's electric current that flows all the way around here, should be equal to the EMF of the battery minus the current flowing through the battery times its internal resistance. And we will use this to solve for the current. If I add little i r to the right, the left side, We get this. I can factor the I out. And then I can solve for I by saying that if I take the EMF of the battery, I divide by the resistance of my external resistor here, and I add to that the internal resistance of the battery, I'm going to get the current flowing through the system. Think about this. This basically says the EMF divided by the total resistance should be equal to the current. The EMF in this case is 12 volts. That's what's coming from the battery. The resistance to that push is R plus R, which is going to be 4 plus 2. That's an ohm. The symbol for resistance is this. I'm, never, I'm not always going to draw it very well. Um, here. Let's just... We can, we, I, can try, I can do a little better, though, right? There we go. 4 ohms plus 2 ohms, 12 over 6 is 2 amps. That's actually a lot of current, but this is a kind of toy problem. Okay. That's what the current is. The other question is, what's the potential difference between A and B? That is to say, what is the voltmeter going to read? Well, this is what the ammeter is going to read. It's going to read that it's 2 amps. The voltmeter is going to read, you can either use this equation or this equation. It doesn't really matter. So if we use this one, then delta V which is equal to the potential difference between points A and B, should be equal to uh, I times R, so 2 amps, times this resistance of 4 ohms. So you're going to get 8 volts. So this would be what we call the terminal voltage of the battery when there's a load placed on it. And it's dependent upon how big of the resistor you put here, right? All right, that's our first circuits problem. The equations are pretty simple. Whether you understand them, I don't know. But hopefully by the end of this week, after we talk more about this stuff, you'll get a good understanding of, of how to handle these systems. This is a very simple one. We'll look at more complex ones, but I'm also going to teach you rules about how you handle them. This is just a special case. Does anyone have any questions before we move on? If you're lost right now, we're going to keep doing stuff like this. You will eventually get it, I promise. It's, it's, it, won't, it won't be hard for you after you see a few more of these. So next thing we want to talk about is electrical power. How does, how does power work in, electric, in, uh, in circuits? So to give you an idea of how this works, I want you to think about um, the units that we have on two different things. So delta V, potential difference, right? What are the units of this? It's a volt, right? And a volt is, does, can anyone type in the chat, what is a volt in terms of other units? Joules per coulomb. That's exactly right. It's joules. Energy, right? Per charge. It's a type of potential energy. Per charge. 
a battery that has a 1.5 volt rating can produce 1.5 joules per coulomb. Okay, what's another thing we learned about? We learned about current. Electric current, the symbol is I. The unit for current is the amp, one ampere. What are the units for the ampere? It has coulombs, right? It's coulombs per something, right? Do you, do you all remember? It's coulombs per second, yeah. Okay, so this is energy per charge. This would basically be energy divided by charge. And then this is charge per second. This tells us the rate at which the charges flow. This tells you the energy you get per charge, right? So we want power. Power is what? The unit for power. What's the what's the SI unit for power? It starts with a W. It's not work. Anyone know what's the SI unit for power? That's one we don't use very much, right? It's a rate. It's a rate of energy usage, right? If I tell you that much, it's it's the watt, yep. And one watt is one joule energy per second, right? Okay, so how can we get these all to combine together? We need to get joules per second, right? We need joules, we need seconds. Oh, did you guys type watts? I didn't see it as quickly as you guys said it. That's okay, though. Um, one watt, one joule per second. We've got joules up here, we've got seconds down here. How do you think we get it? If I want to get electrical power, what do I need to do? Uh, not watts times volts. Nope. Um, watts divided by volts would give you coulombs per second. Ah, uh, there we go. Amp times volts gives you joules per second, right? That is to say, if we take current and you multiply by potential difference, that gives you power. Joules per coulomb times coulombs per second, right? You get joules per coulomb, multiply by coulombs per second, and you get joules per second, which is a watt. There you go, that's it, that's electrical power. Power is equal to current multiplied by voltage. Just to give you an example, if you know, if in your home you have potential difference uh, coming from your wall that's about 120 volts, and you wanna understand the rate at which you use energy, you just need to know how fast are you pushing charges through here, right? If I tell you I've got 120 volts, what I really mean is I have 120 joules for every coulomb that you send to me, right? So if I, if I tell you the rate at which I'm sending charges through in terms of coulombs per second, then all you need to do is to multiply that by that. So if you have an, you know, you can look on your devices at your home if you want to. You can look on your, your charger for your cell phone and it's gonna tell you exactly the rate at which it uses current, okay? Maybe one of you can look at your cell phone charger now, I don't know. It's gonna say something like one amp at 0 0.5 volts or something like that. You're assuming that's why some charges can charge faster than others because it's a higher amp rating. Yes. Yeah, that's right. So your, your, your cell phone charger might say something like 1 amp at 0 0.5 volts. What does that mean? Well, if you take this times this, that's a, pow that's a power consumption. You're, con you, you're, you're consuming power at a rate of 0 0.5 watts. And you could figure out you know, how, how, how long you know, what does it cost to charge your phone overnight and stuff like this from, from this type of information. Um, and that, you know, that's the kind of problem I think you'll have to probably show up on your homework. But um, any device you have, anything, yeah, it literally says a voltage. Look, at, look closely at your, at your charger. Um, and it's, it's, it's definitely going to have writing on it. And it will tell you the current and the voltage, or it will tell you the power. One of those three things is going to be on there. It has to have it on there. It says, so yours says 125 volts 
Is 125 volts, are you sure? That's the input, maybe. Does it tell you what the output is, Adil? It probably takes in 125 volts. Yeah, it's on the cube, but it should say something else. You're talking about an iPhone charger, right? Okay, Ashes says 20 volts. That sounds about right for a laptop. 20 volts at 6.75 amps. So we can figure that out really quickly. So if you take 20 volts and you multiply by 6.75 amps, you can figure out how much money it costs to charge your laptop. Okay? I'll just show you how to do this real quick here because I'm pretty sure this shows up in your homework. So 20 times 6.75 is 135 watts okay when you pay for energy when you okay so deal you found this yeah, 5.2 volts out yeah so you take 5.2 and you multiply by 2.5 that's cool now you can you notice that the volt rating for your your cell phone charger is quite a bit lower in terms of its voltage right okay meowers just told us that the cost in torrents of electricity is about 18 cents per kilowatt hour that's usually how it is. Uh, it's not 18 cents per kilowatt, because a kilowatt is a rate. It's it's kilowatt hours, what they call it. So it's 18 cents per, and then it's written as kilowatt, which is 1,000 watts times hour. That's what you, that's usually what you pay for. So if you used one kilowatt, if you used a device that had, had a rating of 1,000 watts for an hour, it would cost 18 cents, okay? How long does it take to uh, charge your laptop, uh, Ash? That was your laptop, right? How long does it take to charge? Do you know? Hour or two? Fully charge in two hours? Okay, so in two hours, you would take two hours. You need to multiply by the rating in... Oh, it doesn't hold a lot of charge. Fair enough. Uh, you multiply by the rating in terms of kilowatts. So that's 0.135 kilowatts. The kilowatt hour, okay, a kilowatt hour is a unit of energy. Okay, because that's what you pay for. You don't pay for power you pay for when you actually use it. Um, so one kilowatt hour is, um, is is a unit of energy, just so you know, because you're taking watts times hours. This is the unit we use. Instead of using joules, we use kilowatt hours. So you take two hours times 0.135 kilowatts, and then you'd multiply by the cost. Whoops. You'd multiply by the cost, which is 0 0.18 dollars, dollars uh, per kilowatt hour. And that's going to tell you, it's not going to cost much, right? It can't cost much to charge a laptop, otherwise you would notice it on your bill. Uh, let's see, 135, and then times 0.18. It's going to be a few cents, right? Looks like 5 cents. It's about 0 0.0486, which is about a nickel. It's about one nickel. Shiny nickel. So it does not cost much to charge your laptop, right? But... Other devices in your home, they, do, they use more power. If you have a washer-dryer in your home, running a dryer uses a lot of power. Um, your microwave uses a lot of power, too, but you only run the microwave for, like, two minutes at a time. Uh, air conditioning units might have as much. If you have a central air conditioning unit, then uh, the air conditioning unit may have a power rating of, like, 5.5 kilowatts, okay? And this is related directly to the current that it draws and the operating voltages that it uses, okay? And all this information can be found on any electrical device you have in your home. And that can tell you, you could predict exactly how much it would cost to run these things. So if you have a family member or you have uh, someone in your home where you grew up and they told you you need to turn off the lights because you're wasting all this money, you're wasting the electricity or something like that, you now know how you can counter them and be like, you know what, I left that light on all night in my room, but it actually, it only costs two cents, you know? Um, these are all things you can figure out. Light bulbs have a power rating on them, right? You plug a light bulb into the wall, it might say 100 watts. It might say 60 watts. You probably figure out that a 100-watt light bulb uses more power than a 60-watt light bulb. You shouldn't leave things plugged in. It's okay to leave some things plugged in. I mean, your laptop isn't really going... If, you're, if, you're, if your laptop is charging, once it reaches a full charge, if it's turned off, it's probably not drawing very much power. How much money you've wasted in power over your lifetime? You could figure that out. You could roughly estimate it. It's probably not much. I guess the question would be, do you, do you pay for your own power? Because that's how you figure it out really quickly. They tell you each month exactly how much you use. And you can see when it goes up. Like in the wintertime, it usually goes up. It also goes up in the height of summer if you're using electricity, if you're using a, a air conditioning unit, right? So, um, 
what you could do um, also, by the way, with this equation, is that we can combine it with Ohm's law. And if we combine it with Ohm's law, we get a couple more equations here. So Ohm's law tells us that delta V is equal to I times R, right? So if delta V is equal to I times R, that means power can be written as I times, replace delta V here with I R. And this would give us the power in terms of current and resistance, I squared R. There's another version, and you can work it out for yourself, but it's basically delta V squared divided by R. Okay, These three equations will tell us at any moment in time what the, um, you know, it'll tell us exactly what's going on with power. You could even use it, for example, if you knew the power of a light bulb, okay, and you knew the voltage that it was applied across, you could actually figure out the resistance of your light bulb if you want to. I think you might have a homework problem about that. So just as a way to kind of reinforce these ideas and see how they're used, uh, we're going to use the same... Whoops. Didn't mean to do that. I think I... Well, I, mean, I didn't do anything. So we're going to take the last problem that we did, and we're just going to ask a couple more problems, uh, a couple more questions about it. So we'll, cut, we'll copy it. So we're going to use the same circuit, and we're going to ask these two questions now. The first question we're going to ask is to find the power dissipated by the resistor. And keep in mind that we had already solved that in this problem, I believe that the current flowing we said was equal to 2 amps, right? So now we want to find the power dissipated in the resistor. I chose to use this word because it's the word you're going to see used a lot. Uh, hopefully this doesn't confuse you too much. The idea is that as electricity passes through the resistor, it is going to get hot and that heat is going to basically be dissipated out of the resistor, okay? Um, that energy is gonna leave the system, and we wanna figure out the rate at which that occurs. Find the power dissipated by the resistor. Our equation tells us that all we need to do is to take the current squared and multiply by the resistance. The current in this case was two amps. We're gonna square that, and we're gonna multiply by the resistance, which in this case is four ohms. And you're going to get 2 times 2 is 4, times 4 is 16, and the unit is going to be watts. Okay? That's the first question. Anyone have any questions about that? The second question is, if the resistor was replaced by R equal to 8 ohms, so basically we want to replace this guy with 8, we now want to find the power dissipated in the resistor. Okay, to do this, what do y'all think? Do we need to do we need to recalculate the current, or is the current going to be the same if we put an eight ohm resistor in there? Current should change exactly, because we saw before we calculated that the current was equal to the EMF of the battery divided by the resistor R plus little r. What should happen now? There's more resistance in the circuit. What's going to happen to the current? Should the current go down or should it go up? What's your prediction? Down. Yeah, that's exactly right. 12 volts, we've got... Think of this. This is our energy, and this is the resistance to that energy, right? So if you if you have more resistance, you're going to have less current. Um, so this becomes 8 ohms, plus we still have to include the resistance of the battery, the 2 ohms. Now, a lot of your problems, you won't need to worry about resistance within the battery itself, but in this one we still do. So 12 volts divided by 10, and now we're going to get 1.2 amps, and now if I want to find the power for the 8-ohm resistor, so this was the 4-ohm, power for the 8-ohm resistor, again, is going to be now 1.2 amps squared. You always square the current, and then you multiply by the resistance. It's pretty simple. Oh, boy. 1.44 times 8. I do not know what that is off the top of my head. What's 12 times 8? 96? 9.6 times 12? That's, again, not very easy. It's going to be something like... I don't know. 11.52. Thank you. So now the power dissipated is lower than it was here. It seems like in this case that having a smaller resistor will lead to more power consumption by that resistor. Now if you think about it, which one of these would drain the battery faster? 
In which case is the battery going to burn up faster? In which case will we use up the battery faster? One thing I'll say is that batteries will often have written on them something like, I don't know, like it might say something like 15 milliampere hours. This is a unit where you take the amps times the hours. Um, this kind of tells you the the lifetime. In fact, I don't know, I was going I was looking at cell phones this week and so I was asking them what the lifetime of the battery was and they actually told me the answer in milliampere hours and I said I don't really care about that. I just want to know how long it's going to last before I have to recharge it. And they're like, "Okay, that's like 12 hours." So this is a lot harder to read, but it, it is a quantifiable thing uh, that's going to be written on those batteries. Um, yeah, the first one, this is going to use up the power more quickly. So eventually this battery will go dead, right? Yeah, Ash, it definitely depends on phone usage. That's why this answer is technically better. Because if you're, if you're using the phone at a very low ampere rating, if you're not consuming that much current while you're using it, it'll last longer, right? But uh, anyway. Okay, one last question, and this one I'm going to have y'all think about for a couple minutes. What value of R will lead to a maximum power dissipated in the resistor? What value of R will lead to a maximum power dissipated in the resistor? What do y'all think? Oh, I'm apparently drawing over here. I didn't realize. How would you figure that out? Uh, zero? Well, the problem with zero is that the power is proportional to the resistance. So if it's zero, then the answer is going to be something times zero. Yeah, you get zero. Um, it looks like a smaller R is better. Right? It looks like a smaller R is better. But keep in mind that the power is proportional to R. So if the, if the R becomes too small, then you're not going to get um, much power out of it. Right? The current might be big, but if the power is really, you know, if I pick like 0 0.1 for this this one right here, um, I'm going to get about 6 amps. 6 squared is 36, but then I have to multiply by 0 0.1. So I'll get 3.6. You see the problem? And that actually is smaller than both of these. So where is it maximum? How do you figure, how do you answer a question like that in general? If someone comes and tells you, just in general, I want to find the maximum. You got to use calculus. That's exactly right. You got to use calculus. In particular, what do you got to use? You find the derivative. Exactly. So that's what I want y'all to do. I'll, I'll at least point you in the right direction to say that we need to combine these two equations, right? Oops. We need to combine these two equations together because they both have an R in them, right? So the power is going to be equal to the EMF divided by... Uh, R plus R squared, right? That's the current. The current shows up right there. So we got to put it in E over R plus R. That's the current. And we got to multiply that times big R. You want to maximize this function. With respect to R. Which, as you said, will involve find the derivative and then set the derivative equal to zero. So give it a shot. You can plug in numbers if you want, if, if you're more comfortable. Plug in a number for E and R as given, 12 volts and two ohms. And yeah, give it a shot. I don't know how long that'll take you. So I'll give you like three minutes because we're kind of at the end of our time and we'll solve it at the end. You can definitely do it without plugging in numbers, but if you want to plug in numbers, you can. The numbers would be What variable are you going to take the derivative with respect to? There's only one variable, right? Big R.
It's not a minimum, it's a maximum. But I believe that is the correct answer, Ash. Yes. Yeah, that's the better answer, Tyler. When r equals little r. Yep. But both are correct. If you solved the top one, you would have gotten big R equal to little r. And if you solved the bottom one, you would have gotten r equal to 2 ohms. Or if you solved the top one and plugged in the numbers, you would get r equal to 2 ohms. But it turns out to be the case that when r is equal to r, in this case, uh, you get the maximum power output. So... Let's, I guess we solve it real quick here. Um, so let's use that one. Then sort of the side. I'm gonna, I'm not very good at memorizing the quotient rule, so I'm gonna write it like this. And then we're gonna do the derivative with respect to big R. Um, this is just a constant. Low D high minus high D low divided by low low. That's a, that's a good way to remember it. I like that. So this one, we're going to take the derivative of this one first. So you're going to get negative 2 times R plus little r. And then you subtract one from the power, so it becomes negative 3. Um, please tell me if I'm doing something wrong. Uh, multiplied by just R. And then that's plus. Um, we take the derivative of the second term, which is just 1. So it'd be e squared times r plus little r to the negative 2 times 1. You can leave the 1 in there in case you want to do that. We need to set this equal to 0. By setting it equal to 0, we can um, we can rearrange the terms so that it becomes uh, e squared uh, times r plus little r to the negative 2. That's the second one. It should be equal to uh, 2 times the emf squared times r plus little r to the negative 3. Um, a lot of things cancel. Cancel, cancel. Uh, this whole thing is going to cancel, I believe, right? And this will go down to, to the negative 1 power. Oh. That's for next time. And then I keep looking at the chat to make sure I'm not making mistakes. So this ends up being 1 is equal to, and now we're going to plug in, like, rewrite it the normal way, 2 over r plus r, and then that leads to, uh, what, r plus little r is equal to 2, so big R is equal to, did I make a mistake, didn't I? I must have made a mistake. Did I make a mistake? I don't know. No one's saying anything. So it's equal to 2 minus little r. That's not what. That's not the right answer, is it? I, I made a mistake somewhere, didn't I? Because this would give us zero. What did I do wrong? You used Wolfram because you're lazy. I can't blame you. You can also plot it, and you can see that there's a peak at r equal to two. What did I do wrong? Okay, this derivative, you pull the 2 down in front, and then you subtract 1 from the power, multiply by this. Our equation was e over r plus r squared. Okay, plus, when we take the derivative of this, which is 1, we add the 2 to over here. We end up getting 1 on the left-hand side, and then 2 over this on the right-hand side. We're running out of time. I only have two minutes to figure this out before uh, before we have ended our time. Anyone help? What did I do wrong? Should we go ahead and use your the low D high method? You want to try that? So the e squared disappears, right? So well, let's tr let's try the low D high method. You did the pro okay. So Tyler, what did I do wrong? Help me. <laughs> did I do my derivatives wrong? I feel like I did my derivatives wrong somehow. 
Derivative of this would be negative 2, r plus r to the negative 3. So it's the, is it just the algebra then? You're saying the calculus looks right to you? Calculus looks right to me too. Negative 2, r plus r to the negative 3. I'm not going to be able to see it unless I redo it. I know it. So the other way to write this would have been uh, e squared over r plus r squared is equal to 2 e squared over r plus r to the third power. Oh, there it is. Thank you. It's right there. There we go. That's right. Thank you, Bella. I appreciate that. This was times r. Where can I put it? This whole thing is times r. Yeah. So this would be 2 times r. So this would be 2 times r. And then you get 2r minus big R. You get little r is equal to r. I'm so glad you found that just in time because it's 9, 10 now. I really appreciate you figuring that out. Okay. That's all right. We've been here for a long time. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording here, and uh, I'll mention what we're going to talk about next time. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, equivalent resistance of circuits, but the primary source of our uh, talk is going to be about what's called Kirchhoff's rules, and I've got a few example problems that we'll look at. So primarily we're going to be talking about Kirchhoff's rules, and then the very last thing we'll talk about is RC circuits, where we combine together a resistor and a capacitor, and we see what happens, and I think that's some pretty interesting stuff. So. Uh, hopefully I'll see you guys on Thursday night. Thanks for uh, stopping by. Where's my OBS?